We call it a pointy carrot rather than a stick. We don't have gold, silver, bronze or A, B, C, D, E. We have, if you're a beginner, you're emerging. If you're getting better, you're evolving. If you start to have policies and targets, you're now embedded status and so on. So we're trying to say there isn't a bad place to be as long as you're on the journey. Hello and welcome to the King's Business School Connections podcast. I'm Dr. Catherine Tilley. I'm a senior lecturer in business ethics and sustainability, and I'm the impact director of the Centre for Sustainable Business. And today I'm here with Kevin Dunkley, who's the chief sustainability officer of HH Global. Kevin, thank you for joining us. Now, I'd just like to talk a little bit about chief sustainability officer as a title. It's a relatively recent role in a lot of organisations. Can you tell me a little bit about what it means to you to be the CSO at HH Global? Hi, Catherine. Thank you. Delighted to be here. If I start with HH Global, we're a a global tech-enabled creative production and procurement business. And what that means is we activate big marketing campaigns for global brands across 65 countries. So when we're doing that, we have to do that in the most responsible way we can. And we've been focused on that for a long time. When we originally started, we realized we needed a focal point, and that's where the role of Chief Sustainability Officer came into play. In those early days, it was just one person, me. We've come a long way since then, but it was really a moment in time where our CEO at the time said, we need someone just to focus on this area and build capability to learn. And so the role was born within our business about eight years ago. So you've been doing this for eight years, and during that time, I imagine it's changed quite a lot because... One of the things we're seeing now is a lot more attention by companies on the social and environmental issues in the supply chain. Now, obviously, with the work that you do for your clients, you're managing a hugely complex supply chain. How are you setting priorities for that? And how are you making sure that everybody is complying with those standards? Yeah, that is the focal point for most of the clients we talk to. As the subject has matured, organizations have realized their own impact within the four walls of their own organization is within their control. But the majority of their emissions and carbon impact, if we just think about environmental for a second, is outside of their four walls of their business. You often hear about scope three from a carbon emissions point of view, but also supply chains are full of people. So businesses are quickly realizing that their immediate supply chain and the daisy chain of supply chain from that point on is critical that you understand and wrap your arms around. Now, that's really easy to say, but hard to do. So an organization like HS Global, and we're not the only ones, but an organization like us that is the conduit to big brand supply chains becomes a really key partner. We can help with the use of technology, with the use of credible programs around the EDS and the G, help our big brands understand and have more transparency about what's happening in the supply chain. So the first sort of thing that brands do is understand what well, Who are my suppliers? Who are my tier one, tier two, tier three? Where are they? And what information do I have about them? You actually find in the early days, they don't have a lot of information. So that's one of the problems that partnering with an organization such as us can help to solve. I'd really like to pick up on that information and transparency point because it seems to be a huge trend at the moment. And with a lot of incoming legislation, particularly around reporting, we're seeing a lot more pressure on the brands to understand what's going on and to gather accurate information. And I'd really like to understand a little bit about how you do that. How do you get and assemble all this data and then bring it to your clients in a way that helps them make sense of it? Yeah, it's tricky. I would say what we observed in the early days were spreadsheets flying around in every which direction you can imagine. The marketplace and the subject has matured to a point now where technology platforms, and there are some big, well-known, very commonly used platforms help organizations, I wouldn't say the word assess, but gather information around where their supply chain is, what their maturity is on the subject. There's a big focus on risk. What is the risk? Where's our exposure? Are there certain product categories or regions of the world that have a higher risk rating or threshold than others? There are. We also like to look at the other side of that coin in the opportunity. So not just what could go wrong, what could go right, because the obvious opposite to a risk is an opportunity. So I think having watched and observed how we've been assessed and how we've had information gathering asked of us, we've seen what we believe doesn't work. And we've tried to tip that into a more encouraging partnership and collaborative approach with our supply chain partners. 
And I think that's proven to work a bit better. So using tech is essential. To scale anything, you're going to have to have tech. It gives you automation, consistency, data and insights. But I think it's the way you deploy the tech that's key. There's a lot of fatigue in organizations at the minute, particularly in supply chains, where they've got a number of clients asking them the same questions or similar questions over and over again. And this isn't paid for work. This is information gathering that's always urgent. And you need to collate teams to pull that together. It isn't one person who can answer all the questions. So it's a bit of a heavy lift for some suppliers. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that you're reframing it from risk to opportunity partly to engage the brands, but also to help make it a bit more compelling for the suppliers. But obviously, reporting and targets are just the beginning. It's great to have that data, but we need to start to see that turning into change. What are the sort of initiatives that you're taking to start to meet some of those ambitions? I think every organization has to look at itself, first of all, and say, what are the impacts it has from its products and services and its supply chain and its stakeholders? What is that impact? Where can we make a difference as an organization? And then focus on the big areas. In our world, the supply chain is 99% of our carbon emissions. And you could argue outside of our stakeholder group, there's thousands of people working within those businesses. A supplier is just a business. We prefer to call them a supply chain partner because I think that's key. I think the word supplier is quite brutal and succinct. We like to think about working with supply chain partners, collaborating, And so we started off with a program a couple of years ago called the Sustainable Procurement Framework. And and its principles were not to give the supply chain another assessment. The world doesn't need another assessment. It was to say, we already work with you. We have a body of information about you already. We're contractual partners. We have codes of conduct. We already know so much about you. But that was a kind of moment in time. What have you done since then? So we try and say, here's where we think you are on a maturity from a sustainability perspective, looking at all facets, we use the UN Sustainable Development Goals as the framework. And we say, we think you're around this level, but tell us if we're wrong. Have you electrified your fleet of trucks? Have you moved to completely renewable energy? Have you got a female CEO? Have you been doing things in the environmental space we don't know about? And so we encourage them to tell us what they've been doing, which will automatically improve their maturity rating. Now, those ratings are meant to be encouraging. We don't have gold, silver, bronze, or A, B, C, D, E. We have, if you're a beginner, you're emerging. If you're getting better, you're evolving. If you're starting to have policies and targets, you're now embedded status and so on. So we're trying to say there isn't a bad place to be as long as you're on the journey. And then we're trying to help you along by sharing, based on where you are, sharing information, training, policy boilerplates, what we found works, what we found doesn't work. So the whole program is driven by tech, but it's meant to be, we call it a pointy carrot rather than a stick. I love that idea of a pointy carrot and also your way of turning something that could be quite burdensome, which is the reporting, into something that's an opportunity and focused on learning. I think we're also in an environment where supply chain sustainability is a really rapidly developing field. And clearly you are working with your partners to make sure that you're all learning. But what do you think that managers in the brands or in business in general need to be doing now to adapt to all of that change that's going on? Constant learning journey. I think everybody is learning and we need to do it fast and we need to share what we're learning. So I think the first thing, no matter what function you're in an organization, you need to smell the coffee now because I hear people in throwaway comments saying, well, it doesn't affect us. I'm in the legal department or it doesn't affect us. I'm in the technology. It does absolutely affect everybody because There are things and levers that every single function within an organization can do. So I think it's incumbent on people in my role to raise awareness through education, through training, not through just policies, but also by incentivizing people, sharing the success stories. So with the supply chain program we were just talking about, I think it's important to recognize suppliers that have moved a long way in a short space of time. So we've had award ceremonies driven by data, by the way, not subjective panels of people choosing the data defines which organizations have come quite a long way in a short time. And we've had award ceremonies in Mexico, Brazil, Hong Kong, Prague, London, Chicago, where suppliers are recognized in front of their peers for having moved a long way on their holistic understanding of sustainability. So I think that's gone down really well with the supply chain partners. And I think other supply chain partners seeing that gives them something to aspire to. Also awards within an organization. So 
what we've started to find is that the awards we recognize our staff with, there is a whole category around sustainability. A circular economy program that we launched last year, that project team were the winners in 2023 of what we call the Big Impact Awards. Now that sent a ripple around the business as well is, wow, this sustainability, there's a multifunctional team that won that. So I think recognition of progress is key because this is a big, daunting, complex subject we're talking about here. And I think celebrating the wins where people have engaged, collaborated, and some outcomes have been achieved is important. So it's great as someone sitting in a university to hear your emphasis on learning. What are the initiatives you're taking yourself in your team to learn? There's one particular initiative we're very proud of that's just culminating right now, which is around Earth Day 2024, where King's Business School and HS Global and a partner called Pinwheel have collaborated on a program to see what will make a global workforce across 65 countries engage on the topic of sustainability. It's complex. So we chose a nature-based sustainability theme, 4,500 people, 64 countries, languages, all the nuance and cultural complexity there to give everybody in the business $10. So nearly $50,000 has been assigned by our CEO. A campaign of, of messaging, mainly by email, but some video to all staff has been run since the end of February, and we've been A-B testing the messaging, the imagery. So some people got a static image of a forest, some got an animated GIF of turtle hatchlings, others got a personalized email, some got a generic email, some were signed by the CEO, some were signed by myself. And we've, Kings have been in the background observing what worked, which people reacted to which particular call to action and marketing metric. On top of that, we're also checking who voted for which of the various nature-based programs. So the LATAM team had their own four projects, Asia Pacific team had their own and so on. So we're going to end up with a really interesting piece of insight and research here on what made people engage and when they did engage, what did they engage with, which I think will be fascinating. So together, we're going to deliver some really nice research, which we'll share later this year. I'm really looking forward to reading that. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's been a huge pleasure listening to you talking about, first of all, how sustainability can be a positive and an opportunity and not just a cause of fear. Secondly, how you can use data partly to help your clients solve their problems, but also to engage your supply partners in making their businesses better. And thirdly, that sustainability is an ongoing program of learning and that you're prepared to partner to make that happen. I'm personally really excited about it and look forward to your next publication. Thank you so much for joining us on the King's Business School Connections podcast. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for listening to Connections. Subscribe for more insights into the issues shaping business, the economy and society.